Grading systems, they're the reason that some of us got into the college of our dreams while others decided maybe school isn't for us. Be it a zero to a 100, an F to an A, a pass to a fail, grading systems are a part of everyday life. But grading systems go far beyond just the scope of academia. We apply grades to everything in life, safety of restaurants, whether or not your car passes its inspection. And most importantly, we assign grades to ourselves within the confines of a company, CEO, mailroom worker, accountant, which even though they may not be branded as grades are a reflection of how far you sit up on the totem pole of hierarchy in your company. And there's no place in real life where this is more prevalent than places like the military, where you have privates and sergeants and staff sergeants and colonels and commanders. And as you work your way up these grades, you get less and less people with these grades. Which makes sense, because everybody who enters starts at private, at least for the most part, and only those who work particularly hard make their way up. In anime worlds, this is really no different. Naruto, they have Genin and Chunin and Jonin and Special Jonin. In Bleach, they have third seat, second seat, first seat, and then captains of the Gotei 13. And in JJK, they have grades. See, every user of Jujutsu in the JJK universe has a grade, and those grades go from grade four all the way to special grade. Now, this grading system was created off the backs of grading cursed spirits. Weaker cursed spirits are grade four, grade three, middle strength cursed spirits are grade two, higher strength cursed spirits are grade one, and special grade. And this grading system is reflected upon Jujutsu sorcerers, with a grade a Jujutsu sorcerer receives being entirely predicated on whether or not they can defeat a certain level of cursed spirit. That is the Say, if you're a jujitsu sorcerer who's able to easily dispatch a grade one cursed spirit, you yourself are a grade one sorcerer. And while there isn't a whole lot of grade one sorcerers, in fact, there's only five, at least five that have been canonically confirmed to be grade one sorcerers, there is a grade above grade one, and that's special grade. And as it pertains to both cursed spirits and jujitsu sorcerers, special grade is well, special, but it's a whole lot more special for sorcerers. See, there are 12 registered and non-registered combined. See, there are 12 registered and non-registered combined cursed spirits, which is a lot, especially when considering the power of these entities. And that number seems all the more intimidating when you consider the fact that there's only four special grade sorcerers and only three of them aren't evil. And we're gonna be talking about those four sorcerers today. Their abilities, their backstories, how strong they are, and most importantly, where they fall in respect to each other. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are talking all special grade sorcerers in JJK, ranked and explained. Before we start ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like me explaining anime, then you're gonna love my anime podcast that I do with Danny Mata, where me and him break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. It's also called Otaku's Anonymous. I feel as though I should mention that. So, special grade. It sounds like the grade my middle school tried to send me to when they didn't understand why I was jumping around the room while the teacher was trying to teach. But in the JJK universe, it's a good thing. See, special grade is a rank reserved for anomalies in the jujitsu community. Sorcerers with such a measurable strength that the amount of destruction they can impart is almost immeasurable. And as you can imagine, with words as lofty as immeasurable being thrown around, getting that rank is rather difficult. Which is why there's only four jujitsu sorcerers in the entirety of the JJK manga who have ever received this moniker. Well, at least that are currently alive. There was special grade sorcerers prior. And in fact, there was most likely more special grade sorcerers than four prior, as the current age of jujitsu is one of the weakest it's ever been. But that's not to say that the four special grade sorcerers who have received this title are weak, or that they couldn't have survived in the golden age of jujitsu a thousand years ago. It's just to say in 2016, when the JJK manga takes place, that there's less of these special grade sorcerers than there would have been in other time periods. So who are these four special grade sorcerers? What are their backstories? What are their powers? And who's the strongest out of all of them? Well, with no further ado, let's get to ranking these four very special little sorcerers. Well, even though, like I've already stated, the damage that any of these jujitsu sorcerers could unleash in the world is nigh immeasurable, there does have to be a weakest on this list. And the weakest on this list, in my personal opinion, is Yuki. So Yuki is actually somebody that anime only people will soon get to know, as she played a pivotal role in both Ghetto and Gojo's early life. So Yuki is a bit of an anomaly. So Yuki did receive the special grade rating. However, Yuki, outside of Kenjaku, was the only special grade sorcerer not associated with Jujutsu High. But her reasons for not being associated with the high school aren't the same as Kenjaku's. See, why Kenjaku slash Ghetto weren't slash aren't associated with Jujutsu High is because they want to destroy Jujutsu High. Their motivations are to 
forcefully awaken the entirety of Japan's population to cursed energy. And once all of Japan's population learned how to control cursed energy, cursed energy will no longer be released and therefore cursed spirits will disappear. However, of course, this does require killing off anybody who isn't able to awaken to cursed energy. Now, if you were to boil down Kenjaku slash Ghetto's reasoning for not siding with Jujutsu High, it would sound slightly similar to Yuki. That is, if you were to say Kenjaku and Ghetto don't associate themselves with Jujutsu High because they disagree with the sentimentalities of the higher ups. And this is the reason that Yuki doesn't associate with the high school either. But Yuki is not trying to destroy the system that Jujutsu High has created. She simply just doesn't take missions from Jujutsu High, but instead tries to rid the world of curses in her own way. Now, Yuki is an incredibly outspoken and forthright woman, and she's actually played a very pivotal role in the histories of some of the most important characters from JJK. She's the person who taught Toto the line, what kind of girls do you like? As she's the one who showed up at his middle school and recruited him into the Jujutsu Society. But probably the most important role she's ever played in anybody's life was Ghetto's. See, when Ghetto introduces herself to Yuki, she says, I'm special grade sorcerer Yuki. To which Ghetto replies, oh, you're the... And she cuts him off and goes, the no good special grade sorcerer who just bums around overseas? Yeah. Dude, the reason that Yuki doesn't agree with Jujutsu High is because she believes that they only try to treat the symptoms of the cursed spirit problem. That is to say, they simply eradicate the cursed spirits as they appear. But Yuki is trying to get to the root of the cause. She doesn't want to kill off the cursed spirits. She wants to make it so cursed spirits aren't made anymore. And in order to accomplish this, she's found two separate ways. The first of which is to eliminate cursed energy from humanity as a whole. But considering the fact that the only person that Ghetto had ever seen with the ability to pull this off was Toji using his heavenly restriction, the possibility of everybody on Earth achieving heavenly restriction seemed Slay. The second possibility and the possibility that Yuki was pursuing is teaching the entire world how to control their cursed energy because Jujutsu sorcerers don't create cursed spirits. However, while explaining these two possibilities to Ghetto, he talked about a third possibility, killing all non-sorcerers. Anybody who wouldn't be able to adapt to learning jujitsu would simply be killed off, forcing the evolution of humans to make everybody a cursed energy user and therefore eliminate all cursed spirits. And therefore Yuki, most likely unintentionally, was the person who seeded the idea of killing all non-sorcerers into Ghetto's head. And Yuki isn't necessarily opposed to this idea. She explains that it most likely would be the easiest way to do it. However, she's not that crazy. She then tells Ghetto to find his own answer. If he wants to kill all the non-humans or if he wants to go a different route like her. Now, unfortunately, Ghetto and Yuki wouldn't see each other again until after Ghetto's death. They meet again during the Shibuya incident. But once again, they have a psychological conversation between the two of them about how to rid the world of cursed energy. And it's at this point that Pseudo Ghetto, also known as Kenja, who states that he wants to optimize cursed energy, while Yuki has committed herself to the heavenly restriction route. Now, where Yuki's real big role comes from is from the perfect preparation arc. At this point, that Yuki and Choso are trying to defend Tengen against Kenjaku. And in this arc, Yuki and Kenjaku come to blows. Now, Yuki is nothing to scoff at when it comes to power. She, after all, was Toto's teacher and is the reason he's as powerful as he is today. That being said, her training was so grueling for Toto that it's actually how he acquired his scar in the first place. Now, the first real time that we ever got to see Yuki's powers is when she came up against Urame, who's Sukuna's little right-hand man who gets worked by every special grade sorcerer that they come into contact with. And Urame's innate technique is ice control. However, Yuki was able to effortlessly dispel his ice fall with the use of her Shikigami. Now, mind you, Urame is either a high grade one sorcerer or a special grade sorcerer, who was able to push Yuji and everybody who was with him when they were battling against him to their absolute brink, and they would have died without Yuki. But where does Yuki's strength come from? Well, well, like with a lot of other jiu-jitsu sorcerers, these fists. Yuki is a close quarter combat brawler, which is why Toto is a close combat brawler. Yuki supplements her martial arts ability with her massive amount of cursed energy and her innate technique. See, in order to gain the moniker of special grade, you need to have an insane amount of cursed energy, which means Yuki probably has somewhere in the top seven-ish amount of cursed energy out of anybody in the entire universe. But the true way that she supplements her martial arts is her innate technique. Star Rage, which is technically tied to her Shikigami summoning Garuda. The Star Rage does one thing in one thing alone, but that one thing is terrifying. The Star Rage has the ability to give Yuki or Garuda virtual mass. That is to say that Yuki is able to make either herself or Garuda massively more heavy. And we're not talking just a couple of pounds here to push up your weight class to light heavyweight. We are talking tons, if not thousands of tons heavier. And this virtual mass doesn't appear to slow down either Garuda or Yuki, meaning the momentum behind either Garuda or Yuki's blows is massively increased, not at the cost of speed, which allows her to do things like punch through special grade cursed spirits or blow off arms that are being used 
to protect a body. Simply by rolling Garuda into a ball and kicking it, she was able to destroy one of the special grade cursed spirits that Kenjaku had summoned to battle against her. And this special grade cursed spirit used concepts to destroy other cursed spirits. But here's the thing, she's able to increase her mass to a certain extent. Whatever that certain extent is, we're not entirely sure. But because she's increasing her mass, but not her size, she's actually just increasing her density. And that density can be increased to a certain level. And if she increases that density beyond a certain level, it begins to affect her. But should she be in a situation where she's not concerned about the density's effects on her, she can add so much virtual mass to her own body that she creates a black hole. And now, yes, if she does this, it will kill her because like I said, this density increase will begin to affect her and she will be the epicenter of a black hole. But also a black hole has the ability to swallow entire universes. In fact, it stated that the black hole that she created should have destroyed the entire planet. However, because of some circumstances I'm not gonna get into right now, it didn't. Next up on the list, we have a slightly controversial pick, but I think it's accurate. We have Yuta. So Yuta is said to be immensely powerful, probably the whole of the most cursed energy out of anybody in the universe outside of Tsukuna. However, if it came down to a battle between Yuta and Kenjaku, I think I'm taking Kenjaku, but it's close. See, technically Yuta is a special grade cursed human. See, we all got to know Yuta from chapter zero, and Yuta was actually supposed to be the main character of this story, not Itadori. But instead of being the main character after chapter zero, Yuta actually went overseas to Africa to train with Miguel. You know, the guy that Gojo, you know, did this to. See, we learned in chapter zero that six years prior to Yuta enrolling at Jujutsu High, he received a promise ring from his childhood friend, Rika. And when they were grown up, they would get married. However, Rika got hit by a bus coon and Yuta unfortunately was a witness to this however instead of making peace with Rika's death he cursed her death wholly rejecting the reality where Rika was dead and therefore turned her into a cursed spirit now when Yuta ends up in an incident that results in the death of four of his classmates he's marked for execution because it's clear he's being haunted by a special grade curse Yuta decides to take the execution into his own hands and tries to kill himself however Rika saves him and at this point that Gojo finds him and enrolls him in Jujutsu High where Yuta realizes why he's being haunted by Rika and what he did wrong. It's at this point that he begins to make friends with his classmates and realizes life ain't that bad. However, there is a man going around collecting cursed spirits who really wants his cursed spirit. And that man is Ghetto. And Yuta and Ghetto come to blows and eventually Yuta comes out victorious, forcing Ghetto to retreat. Ever since this moment, Yuta has played a very pivotal role in arcs like the Perfect Preparation arc and the Yuji Izadori Extermination arc. And as it currently stands, he is one of the strongest, if not the strongest fighter for the Jujutsu high side outside of Gojo in the battle against Kenjaku and Sukuna. But where does his power come from? Well, he is technically being haunted by the vengeful spirit that is Rika, who was a special grade cursed spirit, but Rika Orimoto's soul is no longer tied to the spirit. As Yuto, in his battle against Ghetto, realized what he had done to his friend's spirit by cursing her death. And therefore, her spirit is released from the vengeful cursed spirit. However, the vengeful cursed spirit still stays with Yuta, as Rika Orimoto actually left the last vestiges of her will to this cursed spirit to keep an eye over Yuta which is a symbol of her love, but also her willingness to let him go. Now, the reason that Yuta was able to put such a strong curse on Rika's death is because he's kind of related to Gojo. See, both him and Gojo share a distant relative by the name of Michizane Sugawara. And Michizane Sugawara is one of the three great vengeful spirits of Japan, which is why Yuta was able to create such a powerful vengeful spirit. However, the creation of powerful vengeful spirits isn't the only thing that Yuta can do. Yuta has also been stated to have more cursed energy than Gojo. And on top of this, he has a proclivity for copying other people's cursed techniques, like he did with Toge's cursed speech. Tie that into the fact that he trained with Miguel and Maki for months on months to make sure his close quarter combat was sufficient, and the fact that he's able to imbue Rika's power into a katana that basically allows him to cut through anything, and it begins to make a little sense why Goju believes that Yuta could one day surpass him in terms of power. Not to mention that Yuta went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Ryu, a reincarnated sorcerer who was brought back through the culling game. And Ryu wasn't just any sorcerer, he was arguably one of the strongest sorcerers brought back during the culling game. Being able to overcome Ryu's physical power without the use of cursed energy and also being able to tank shots from Ryu's strongest attack. And when Yuta eventually defeats Ryu, Ryu states that Yuta is stronger than any jiu-jitsu sorcerer he's ever come up against, be that past 
or present. Mind you, he defeated Ryu after defeating two other reincarnated sorcerers. Mind you, Simbi, by imbuing his katana with cursed energy, Yuta was able to cut down the likes of Drov Lakdawala, who was a sorcerer brought back for the Culling game, who once took over the entirety of Japan during the Civil War of Wa. And he was able to fight on equal terms with Kuroroshi, I think I said that correctly, who was a special grade cursed spirit brought back for the Culling game. Now, mind you, this was a cockroach cursed spirit, so there was a lot of negative energy towards the concept. And this cockroach cursed spirit had the ability to make offspring of itself that were equally powered to it. It also had a thing known as the festering life sword that was able to shoot insects into people's skin that would then hatch and fester inside of them and burst out. Not to mention it also had the ability to create and manipulate massive swarms of cockroaches. And Yuta just went through a town and cut down these special grade sorcerers or cursed spirits back to back to back. And like I've already stated, a lot of this ability comes from the fact that he has the most cursed energy out of any human. Even Ryu, who was stated to have the most cursed energy out of any of the sorcerers brought back through the culling game, stated that his cursed energy felt like it was bottomless. But not only does he have an insane amount of cursed energy, he's also mastered using it, as he is able to superpower his own physical prowess to the level of Yuji, while also being able to maximize his defenses to make sure that anything that comes into contact with him does only a minimum amount of damage. All of this comes through his mastery of the reinforcement technique. But even if hypothetically you do injure him, he's mastered reverse curse techniques, so he can heal any damage done to his body. And here's the thing, much in the same capacity where Gara's sand can act on its own to protect Gara, Rika can act on its own to protect Yuta, and therefore sometimes she'll manifest to help Yuta in a battle. However, Yuta is also able to summon her with relative ease now. He doesn't need to stir up a massive amount of negative emotions, he can just call her and she appears. And Rika, is nothing to scoff at. She was able to immobilize Yuji immediately and she was able to crumble a bridge with one punch. But if Yuta wants to take this one step further, he can completely manifest Rika. So Yuta still has the promise ring that he was given to him when he was six, which is weird, cause like, how does it still fit? But when he completely manifests Rika, he can use her cursed techniques. He gets access to her massive amount of cursed energy, or he can equip some of the cursed tools that he has Rika carry around for him. As Rika is kind of like an extra dimensional cursed spirit backpack for him. And he can maintain this complete manifestation of Rika for five minutes. And yes, on top of this, he has the ability to pretty much copy any curse technique he sees, like cursed speech, the ability to create and manipulate Shikigami, sky manipulation, which allows him to grab the sky and contort it like it's a sheet. And because he's able to manipulate the sky, he's also able to use an ability called Thin Ice Breaker, which allows him to shatter a section of the sky in front of somebody to increase the strength of his punch. It's like punching glass into somebody. So yeah, He's broken, but not as broken as the next entry on our list. See, this entry is kind of a weird one, objectively, because we're talking about jujitsu sorcerers, and Kenjaku is not a jujitsu sorcerer, he's a cursed spirit. However, he is currently inhabiting the body of a jujitsu sorcerer, who also happened to be a special grade jujitsu sorcerer. So I could just talk about Ghetto, and if I was just talking about Ghetto, obviously he's weaker than Yuta, he lost to him in a fight, but I'd rather talk about Kenjaku. So yes, Kenjaku is a cursed spirit, but we're gonna talk about it. Also, Kenjaku is technically a human whose innate technique was the ability to transfer his brain to other people's bodies. So like, I guess he is still a human and therefore a jujitsu sorcerer? I don't know, whatever, it's my video. See, Kenjaku's main goal is to optimize the cursed energy of Japan to recreate the golden era of jujitsu, also known as the Heian era. Heian, he I Heian, I, we're going with Heian. Oh wait, Heian. Tien. Now, Kenjaku, like we've already touched on, has an innate technique that allows him to transfer his brain into other people's bodies. And upon taking over these bodies, Kenjaku just becomes these people. He gets access to the cursed energy, the innate techniques, and the memories of the people whose body he takes over. And here's the thing, those abilities stick with him. See, we know four people that Kenjaku has been outside of Kenjaku a thousand years ago. 400 years ago, he put his brain into an unnamed vessel that he used to make binding vows with sorcerers that would eventually come back through the calling game. The most particular of those being Hajime. But when it really comes down to it, there's three major vessels that we've seen Kenjaku be. Spoilers ahead here. See, the first and most prominent vessel that we've ever seen Kenjaku be is Norotoshi Kama. See, Norotoshi Kama was alive 150 years ago and was hailed as the evilest sorcerer ever. And it was while he was Norotoshi Kama that he came into contact with a woman who accidentally bore a half-human, half-cursed spirit child. However, since she had had the child of a cursed spirit, she was driven out of her home and came to the monastery where Narutoshi Kamo was currently living in order to seek asylum. And you know what she got? 
not asylum, as Naruto Shikamo forced her to be pregnant nine times and also have nine abortions, which resulted in the nine cursed wombs, two of which Esso and Kejizu that Nobara and Yuji have already killed, Chozo, who a lot of you will meet eventually and begin to love, and then six others who haven't been given human vessel bodies to embody. But the cursed wombs weren't done yet, because the next person we know that Kenjaku was, and this is where the spoiler is, so feel free to skip a little bit further, is Kaiori Itadori. Yes, Kenjaku is Yuji's mother. So Kenjaku, masquerading as Kaiori, got his back blown out by Jin Itadori, Itadori's father, in order to create Itadori. Kenjaku, the main bad guy of the JJK universe outside of Tsukuna, is the father slash mother to the main character. Manga makes no goddamn sense. We don't even know why he did that yet. He already had nine cursed wombs. And the last and most recent, because it's literally current vessel he holds, is that of Ghetto. See, after Ghetto was defeated by Yuta, Kenjaku took over his body, gaining his memories, cursed energy, and innate techniques. So tie the fact that he essentially downloads a new move set to himself every time he switches brains and then gets to keep the old ones into the fact that he has an immense amount of cursed energy to the point where when he absorbed Mahito, he didn't have to make any imposing vows in order to make sure that Mahito wouldn't take him over because his cursed energy was so much higher than Mahito's. And mind you, Mahito was a special grade curse who was able to take on numerous grade one sorcerers simultaneously and you have a recipe for a really bad guy now because kenjaku currently inhabits ghetto's body he has curse manipulation and we know at one point he controlled at least three special grade curses simultaneously there was the one he deployed against yuki that yuki kicked garuda through so doesn't have that one anymore there was the smallpox deity that he deployed against mei mei which was so powerful it had its own domain expansion and obviously mahito and i feel as though i don't have to explain to you why having an army of special grade curse spirits something that only a couple of jujitsu sorcerers are able to kill is kind of strong. However, Kenjaku also has a separate ability called Uzumaki. Now, these Uzumakis can be a myriad of different sizes. They can be small, they can be maximum. Now, what Uzumaki does is it gathers massive amounts of cursed spirits together in one huge attack. Now, this attack is only accessible to those who have cursed spirit manipulation because you need cursed spirit manipulation to smash all of the cursed spirits you control into one attack. However, the usage of this technique does destroy the cursed spirits you smash together to use this attack. Unless, of course, they are semi-grade one or higher. If you use a cursed spirit that's semi-grade one or higher, its innate technique is extracted for a one-time use. To put that in terms, you'll understand, he uses this technique after absorbing Mahito, and he puts Mahito into his maximum Uzumaki. Since Mahito is a special grade cursed spirit, upon being placed in the maximum Uzumaki, his idol transfiguration is extracted so Ghetto can use it one time. And Kenjaku uses this against Tengen's barrier to start the culling game. Outside of this, like I stated earlier, Kenjaku still has access to the innate techniques of the people he previously inhabited, like anti-gravity system, which was the innate technique of, you know, the spoiler we talked about earlier, his only female inhabitant. Now, this technique technically allows Kenjaku to release himself or the things around him from gravity. However, Kenjaku applies a curse technique removal to this technique to actually use his technique to increase gravity. And with the power of this technique, he's been shown to undo things like black holes while also being able to pin incredibly powerful cursed spirits and jujitsu sorcerers to the ground under the massive weight of the gravitational pull. Now, he can only affect things two to three meters from him, and he can only use this ability for about six seconds before it enters a cooldown. However, even if you are able to work yourself through the anti-gravity system, you still have to worry about his domain expansion, Womb Perfusion. Now, Womb Perfusion is a lot like Malevolent Shrine in that it's an open-style domain expansion, meaning technically you can escape from it, but its range is massively increased. And we aren't in entirely sure what the effects of womb perversion are. What we do know is that it's so strong it's able to strip away any simple domain being used within the confines of its range. And because it's able to strip away these simple domains, that means anybody trying to nullify the guaranteed hit aspect of Kenjaku's domain expansion only gets to do that for so long. Meaning the only way to really battle against this domain expansion is to have a stronger domain expansion. As things like a simple domain or a hollow wicker basket will only work for a couple of seconds. What we also know about womb perfusion is that after one hit, Yuki, one of the strongest jujitsu sorcerers in the entire world almost died. In fact, Kenjaku was all but sure she should have, which speaks to the level of confidence he has in his domain expansion. So yeah, scary guy, but not as scary as somebody who's fortunately on the side of the good guys, Gojo. Gojo, who hasn't been in the manga for almost three years, recently made a reappearance. And I'm starting to understand why the mangaka decided that Gojo shouldn't be around for those three years, because the second that Gojo reappeared, 
it just became his story again. Gojo is the strongest person in the universe. He is an inheritor of both Limitless and the Six Eyes simultaneously, something that only happens in the Gojo family every 400 or so years. See, I've done entire videos about how strong Gojo is. You can watch them right here. So we're just going to quickly go over what Gojo's abilities are, as we really don't know all that much about his backstory. Really, the most we know about his backstory is what we're about to get in Season 2 of JJK. See, as a student, both Ghetto and Gojo were known as the strongest, and the only person who gave either of them a battle while they were both students was Toji Fushigoro, who was hailed as the Sorcerer Killer, the wielder of the Heavenly Restriction. However, upon coming into combat with Toji and objectively losing, Gojo somehow managed to get a power-up. See, the reason that Gojo might be the most powerful wielder of the Six Eyes and the Limitless simultaneously in the entire history of the Gojo family is because he's figured out something that previous reincarnations simply didn't. See, Gojo has figured out how to wield his Six Eyes and his Limitless limitlessly. See, the reason that wielding the Six Eyes and the Limitless simultaneously is so important is because the Six Eyes massively improve the efficiency of the Limitless, at least such as it pertains to Gojo. See, Gojo technically has less cursed energy than Yuta, and maybe even Kenjaku. But what Gojo has that nobody else has is infinite cursed energy. What do I mean? Well, if we were to say that Yuta has more cursed energy than Gojo, which he does, maybe we could symbolize the amount of cursed energy that Yuta has as this lozenge tin. All of Yuta's cursed energy fits in here. All of Yuta's cursed energy fits in here. Now, every single time that Yuta uses a cursed technique, one of these little lozenges has to come out. And even though Yuta has an insane amount of cursed energy, eventually there won't be any lozenges left. Now let's say Gojo's cursed energy is somewhat comparable to the size of Yuta's. Now every single time that Gojo uses a curse technique, it takes out a little sliver roughly this large. Yes, that is a fragment of lozenge on my finger. Because every single time that Gojo uses a cursed technique, it uses an infinitesimally small amount of cursed energy, with infinitesimally meaning a number infinitely approaching zero. So basically zero, which means Gojo can never run out of cursed energy. And now the usage of the six eyes technically used to put a strain on Gojo's body, and therefore he could only use his six eyes for a certain amount of time, which is how Toji was able to get a leg up on it. However, Gojo mastered some something in his battle against Toji, and that something was reversed cursed energy. Now Gojo is able to, through the powers of his six eyes in his limitless, constantly be undergoing reverse cursed technique, meaning any damage placed on his eyes through the usage of the six eyes is immediately healed. Kind of like Obito having half of Hashirama's cells constantly healing his Kamui eye. On top of this, he also has limitless, which allows him to control the space around him at an atomic level, which grants him three standard abilities, infinity, blue, and red. Infinity makes it so Gojo has a barrier around him that infinitesimally approaches anything that approaches him towards a velocity of zero, which means regardless of how big or fast the object approaching Gojo is, it will never make contact with him. What may appear as it made contact with him, it actually won't. It will just be infinitesimally close. And Gojo is able to decide what does and doesn't touch him based on mass, speed, and danger warnings. His curse technique blue allows him to create negative space. And since technically negative space shouldn't exist, all of the positive space around this negative space rushes towards that area, which in essence makes a gravity well. At the maximum output of this blue, he's able to essentially create black holes. His technique red creates positive space. Now this technique requires a technique reversal of his blue, much in the same way that Kenjaki uses a technique reversal on the anti-gravity system. Now this creates a repulsive force, which repels all matter in its vicinity and is said to be twice as destructive as blue. But since we're still talking about the Limitless, the Limitless also allows Gojo to teleport, as he has control over all space and matter, including his own body, which means he can rearrange his own particles wherever he wants them to be. On top of this, while battling against Toji and mastering reverse curse technique, Gojo figured something else out, a non-standard application of the Limitless, Hollow Purple, that combines both the red and the blue that he controls in order to make hollow matter. This combination of negative and positive energy basically flies in the face of all physical laws. And thus, anything that this laser beam, which appears to be able to be shot numerous miles, comes into contact with is erased from existence. Any mass or matter it comes into contact with is simply gone. And if it really comes down to it, Gojo also has his unlimited void, also known as his domain expansion, which forces all of the information of the universe into the head of anybody trapped into it, paralyzing them. And even after this domain expansion has been closed, the mass amount of information flooded into everybody's brains still leaves them paralyzed. Gojo only needed to open this domain expansion for 0.2 seconds to freeze 1,000 transfigured humans for five minutes, at which point after freezing these 1,000 transfigured humans, he killed 
all of them, which is a lot of transfigured humans per minute. And on top of this, while we've talked in a roundabout way about what the six eyes do, we should talk about what they exactly do. See, the six eyes allow Gojo to perceive time in slow motion. They also give him 360 degree vision for miles, meaning anything within miles of Gojo, he can see, perceive, and find. These eyes also allow him to immediately see the speed, mass, and energy of anything around him, which is how he's able to denote what needs to be stopped by his infinity and what doesn't. These eyes make him see so good that he constantly needs to keep them covered. And the only time he truly doesn't have his eyes covered is when he uses his domain expansion. So yes, this is the man who stated if he wanted to, he could kill everybody in the Jiu-Jitsu society and run it himself. Gojo Satoru, the man who is about to come into combat against a 19-fingered Sukuna. The man who believes even if Sukuna had all 20 fingers, he'd still win. And with that, that is all of the special grade sorcerers in Jujutsu Kaisen. Ranked and explained. So who is your guys' favorite special grade sorcerer? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Every week when a new chapter of JJK comes out, it's so stressful because I know I have to go back and reread the last 10 chapters to remember what was going on.